Welcome to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. We're very pleased to be joined with us, Dr. Nicholas Bloom from the New York Institute of Technology. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. When it comes to a large-scale public housing in the United States, the consensus for the past decade has been to let the wrecking balls fly. The demolition of the infamous projects such as Pruitt Igor in St. Louis and the projects of Cabrini Green in Chicago represents to most Americans the fate of public housing. Yet one notable exception to this nationally tragic tragedy remains, the New York City Public Housing Authority. You wrote a book, Public Housing That Works. What did New York City get right that the other cities did not? Well, I think when you look at the history of New York, it's fascinating because they had this radical idea in the 1930s, which was that poor people in New York City had a right to decent quality housing. And they realized, though, unlike a lot of other cities like St. Louis and Chicago and so forth, that housing wasn't just buildings, that in fact housing was a social system. It was a it was a, a community exercise, if you want to think about it that way. And um, you needed a lot of people to make it work right. And from the beginning in New York, public housing, which was designed for lower-income people, was staffed at levels comparable to those for middle or upper-income people. And that made a big difference. So you had, on a large project, you might have 50 or 60 staff members uh, on these large projects who were responsible for cleaning, painting, changing windows, running the boilers, constant upkeep. And that is a major difference when you go and see even public housing in Europe, many other cities in this country. You just didn't see that kind of staffing levels. The, the buildings were built, uh, but then the people were left alone. You, you've identified in your book uh, the reason, one of the reasons you just stated is that the employees of the New York City Housing Authority had a major role in its success. We represent most of the employees in public housing in New York City. Can you elaborate just a little more? Well, I think when you look historically, and then I'll talk about the how it is today as well, but um, New York City's gone through a lot of the same problems in terms of social issues that other housing authorities have faced. I mean, you go back even to you know that great old days in the 1950s. They had problems back then. Um, there were juvenile delinquency was a problem in the 50s and gangs in the 60s. Drugs were a problem in the 1980s and crack cocaine. And these were the same kinds of problems that hit every city in America. And the difference in New York was that when there was damage to the grounds in public housing or to the buildings and so forth, what was different in New York was they went out and they repaired that damage. And that sent a message to both the tenants and also the people in the city that, one, the city cared about the well-being of the tenants and, in fact, cared about the maintenance of public housing in the long term. New York City just received um, federal funding because they, they had 21 developments, mm -hmm. 15 that was operated by the state and six that was operated by the city. And right. for the last, I would say, 10 to 12 years, the state and city did not put in funding for those developments. Right. And just recently, we called the Federalization of Housing Authority, which means those 21 developments were federalized and received federal funds. Right. And also, there was an investment by uh, Citigroup mm -hmm. into those 21 developments, sure. a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us how much that meant to the New York City Housing Authority? Well, well the big problem, it's New York... When we look historically, the reason we had these state and city projects was that New York, unlike the rest of the country, was really ambitious about how much public housing we wanted to have. We wanted a lot of it. So we had our own separately funded state and city projects. And there were really some great reasons to do it. And um, the only problem was that the state and the city stopped providing that subsidy. And so what that did on an annual basis was there was a, a deficit and so the Housing Authority was basically shifting money from the federal projects to cover the maintenance issues in the state ones. And so what the federalization means is that um, every year now, 
the housing authority will be getting, I believe, on average about $75 million more in federal operating. And also because of the public-private partnership um, received um, a significant, I believe, around a couple hundred million dollars uh, for immediate renovation work in those projects. Are there any lessons that we could learn from the failed public housing in other parts of the country? Well, I think the, the primary, well, there are a number of lessons. I mean, the first one uh, is that, as I said before, public housing is not a set of buildings. Um, it is a social institution. On the one hand, you have the tenants, but just as important is adequate staffing and constant renovation and repair. And that's what you see. When you look at buildings today in New York, you look at public housing buildings, you think you're seeing something that was built 50, 60 years ago, but that simply isn't true. These buildings that you see today have been revamped sometimes two or three different times. So that's a, a key element. From, from your perspective, what are some of the recommendations you could make to improve public housing in the future? Is there something, or is there something that they should continue to do to maintain that service? Well, I think the housing authority has been smart in terms of when the cuts have been made. Um, they've been very careful to make sure that on the grounds, right, in terms of the frontline staff, that those people have been protected over time. Because when you go to public housing projects in New York, you'll see the staff out there cleaning every day. And so I think focusing on the people who are in the front lines and maintaining the buildings is a key element. And that's, that's one thing. I think they've done a good job in terms of social integration, in terms of bringing in more working people. That's been a key element. And that's always, I should say, that goes back to the 1930s in New York, is New York has always wanted public housing to be not just for the very poor, but also for working people who want quality housing in the city. Uh, this was a very meaningful and fruitful discussion. And Nicholas, uh, we had a lot of fun, but it seems that our time is up. So I just want to let everyone know I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters, and our very special guest was Nicholas Bloom, Dr. Nicholas Bloom, who wrote the book, Public Housing That Worked. Please go out and buy the book. It's, it's a very good book, and we should all read it. Nicholas, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank <laughs> you.